Hello, my relatives. I'm happy to see you here today. My name is Kate Bean. I'm also known as Brings Them Home Woman. I'm Berewakantuan and Wakpetuan Dakota. Um, and I'm here today with my Chekpa, my, my twin sister. Um, in our language, we, we call each other Chekpa, which, which actually literally means belly button. Um, we've been connected since before creation. Um, and we do a lot of powerful work together. Um, my sister and I moved here to the Twin Cities with our parents and, and another sister, and we had another sister that was living here when we were in our mid-20s. Um, we weren't raised here in Minnesota. We're uh, citizens of the Flandreau Santi Sioux tribe. Our father was born and raised on our reservation in South Dakota, um, but we were raised always sort of questioning why is it that our family lives on a reservation so far from our ancestral homeland. And so as adults, we moved back home here to Minnesota, and we decided to um, try and reconnect with home. And that's really been sort of, that sort of created the, the beginning of, of our jobs and our work here in this area. And um, one of the first places that my father actually brought us was to a lake that at the time was called Lake Calhoun. We'd read a lot about this space. We knew, I, I had a picture of it in my head um, before we actually even moved here because our grandfather, a writer by the name of Charles Eastman, who was one of the first native physicians and um, was a very prolific writer uh, and advocate for native rights, he had written about it in one of his memoirs. He wrote about our family story there. Our family was removed from Minnesota after the, the Dakota War of 1862. Uh, we were forced out under military guard. Our, our, uh, our relatives were hanged in the largest mass execution in United States history in Mankato. 38 warriors were hanged on December 26, 1862. And our grandparents were imprisoned. Our grandmothers were imprisoned. We were forced out. Um, that's how our family ended up in Flandreau, but there's a long story of that in between. And we grew up hearing bits and pieces. My grandma used to tell me, oh, my grandmother fled on horseback. And as a kid, I always wondered, well, what was she fleeing from and where was she going? But I didn't have all those answers. And so, you know, we really became committed to learning our family story. When our father took us to the lake, we knew that it was some place that we felt deeply connected to and yet we felt very unwelcome. It's a very privileged neighborhood over by Beremakaska, um, formerly known as Lake Calhoun. And it's a place where we didn't see ourselves. There was no recognition of us or our family story or our history. And so something that we became very committed to was righting that wrong and making sure that our presence was known. And um, as our bios state, we, have a, we, we each have a long history of, of work in the Twin Cities. Neither my, tw my sister or I actually graduated from high school. Um, and yet when we moved here, that's when we went back to school. And that's where we um, determined what our futures were going to be. And I became a doctor and my sister became a lawyer. Um, and really what motivated us was this work. And so when you look at the lake, which is about six miles from here, that lake is actually roughly six miles also from Fort Snelling. Um, sometime before 1829, surveyors of the Minnesota Territory bestowed the name Lake Calhoun onto the lake in honor of John C. Calhoun, a South Carolina senator and former vice president under both John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Calhoun had served as both Secretary of State and Secretary of War. He was a staunch advocate of slavery and fought to expand slavery into the Western states. Now here was somebody who, he, he was for slavery, but he also was very active. He fought for the expansion of slavery, and that's something that we need to acknowledge. He was a staunch advocate of slavery and fought for the expansion. Calhoun had authorized the construction of Fort Snelling, and that's why we, we memorialized 
they memorialized him because he advocated for the construction of the fort. He had authorized it. Calhoun had never actually, we don't feel, we don't think that he likely ever stepped foot in Minnesota. And yet he was so fondly remembered. Um, and the Fort Snelling, which is at the junction of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, is, an air, is a space that, is, that is definitely holds a lot of contention for our communities as Dakota people. I work at the Minnesota Historical Society, which manages that site. And one thing that I do have to say is that I'm here today, even though I, I, my job title is, is mentioned within my bio, I'm not here as a representative of the Minnesota Historical Society. I'm here today to talk about work that I've done outside of that institution. But it's also related to work that I do within that institution. And that tension right there of the way that I have to make that statement is actually part of the problem. Um, trying to fit within colonial institutions that historically marginalize us. When we, when we enter these institutions, it's very, very difficult, um, as some of my colleagues who are here today know. Um, and so Calhoun has this, has this reputation um, within our communities that's very divisive. And for many years, people had talked about sort of changing um, the name of that space, but Often it was not with um, communication with the Dakota community. So the Dakota community also has a relationship to Calhoun because Calhoun created the Bureau of Indian Affairs within the War Department. He also um, penned the Indian Removal Act, which was signed into law on May 28, 1830. He penned the first draft of that, which authorized President Andrew Jackson um, to remove indigenous people and led to the Cherokee Trail of Tears and other indigenous removals. And so our communities have a deeper connection to this space than just Calhoun. Our communities had a village site at this space. We had visited this space for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. You know, the connection of Dakota people to Minnesota goes back thousands of years. Our creation, um, we have numerous creation sites, one of them being down by Fort Snelling, which we call Badote. Um, and archeological evidence show 10,000 years of human occupation there, which we know is also us. Um, at Bade Makaska, we had a village site. My family had a village site there. My grandfather was a man by the name of Makapia Wichasha, our grandfather. He, Cloud Man, and he came from the Kaposia village, or the black, actually Black Dog village, which was near Kaposia um, in Imanija Ska, which today people know as St. Paul. Uh, he was born sometime around 1795, and he was a great leader. He was somebody that wasn't afraid to try new things. He was somebody that um, wasn't afraid to take criticism, which I think is what good leaders have to sort of uh, prepare themselves for. Our grandfather, Makpiawi Chashta, um, he was known as a, as a great warrior. And he uh, was living during a time where there was a lot of uh, starvation going on in our community due to, to the result of the fur trade. And so people had to move further and further to hunt. Our people had been corralled onto a very, um, you know, into a smaller, well, actually at that point we hadn't been taken to a smaller area yet, but eventually we would be corralled onto a small res reservation area. But when Wakpia Wichasha was living, um, our, our limitations came from the fact that we had to travel further and further to hunt. And one winter, he had gone off hunting with a group of men, and they had gone near the Missouri River. They'd gone further than they normally go, and they got trapped in a blizzard. They, what they did at that time is they um, buried themselves under the snow for three days and nights, and he didn't know if the men he was with, he didn't know if they were living or not. And he, he buried himself under the snow, and he prayed. And we call God Tunkashara or Wakantanka. And he prayed to Tunkashara. He said, if I, if I make it through this, I promise, I understand, I see now that this isn't working. I'll try something different. And so he lived and he went home and he worked with Indian agent Tolliver um, to create a new community. 
And so our people had normally would um, move with the seasons to different areas. But between 1829 and 1839, my grandfather and his wife, Champa Dutuwi, um, led a community called Heato Tuwe, or village to the side at Bede Makaska. And that community was really important for a number of reasons. Um, one was that this was a place that was uh, one of the first Dakota agricultural settlements. And so our people had historically always farmed. We'd been growing corn for a number of years and, and we'd always had smaller scale gardens, but we'd never used a plow. We never had organized farming in, in sort of the Western form of farming, farming. We didn't need to, you know, we had enough to sustain ourselves. Um, and this was the first time where they really made a concerted effort for a larger scale of farming in order to get that nutritional subsidies to support communities. And so what they did was they, they had farms and um, they grew crops, they grew corn, they grew uh, uh, potatoes, turnips. And this was an area, you know, a lot of people don't know that, but in Makaska, historically, there used to be full of wild rice. And they grew artichoke, and, 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 and um, traditionally artichokes and wild strawberries and berries all grew around that area. And so historically, our community knew that Bene Makaska was a place that had always nourished us. It was always full of fish. And our, our relatives had written about the fact that our, our communities had all often gone there because it was so, it was so abundant uh, with food for us. And so it was a natural place for us to go, so where we could still harvest traditional crops, but we could also grow new crops. Um, and so, you know, the interesting thing about this area, too, is that this was a space where the first missionaries came. Two men by the name of Samuel and Gideon Pond uh, are two of the missionaries that set up a mission house over in between uh, Bene Makaska and Bede Uma, which is also known as Lake Harriet. Um, and they had worked to start trying to convert Dakota people to Christianity. And I spent many years looking through their papers in order to understand the history of this place because we have our old history from our community members, from our family members. Um, but after the 1862 war, a lot of our family members stopped talking about some of this history because it was too painful. And so we know some stories, but I really needed to look through the archives in order to understand um, the broader, a broader story and some of the details. And what was interesting is that you know, I had read a lot of what others had written about my family, and it didn't, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't, it didn't sound like what had been told to me. And so in rereading through the Pond papers, uh, the Pond brothers' journal entries and their letters home to their families in Connecticut, they really, I, I learned a lot. Um, what I learned was that these men, and they, they wrote that they were documenting a dying race of people, that we were going to be a, van we were a vanishing race of people. We were like the dinosaurs. They were documenting us um, and trying to save our souls so that they could go to heaven. And I had always read that my family was, you know, from these other historians had written that my family was this Christian um, Dakota group of people who forsake their Dakota ways and were trying to become white. And I knew that wasn't true because that's not what my family told me. And so I went into the archives and I started rewriting that story. And I started indigenizing and th that history in the archives and thinking, okay, what were my ancestors thinking? And also, I would look back to try and find the papers of my own grandparents and their journal entries to try and, re to try and understand their, their voices and their perceptions of things. And what I found out was that not very many Dakota people actually converted to Christianity during this, era, during this time. It wasn't until after the Dakota War. And so this binary narrative of the Christian Dakota versus the hostile bad Dakota, that's what we're up against. We're up against this history of winners and losers that says, oh, well, you lost the war. You're a bad Indian, you know. And growing up, my family, you know, I remember seeing pictures. My grandmother would show me pictures of my father growing up on the reservation. And, and they, him and his friends would play cowboys and Indians. And it was a, Flandreau is a, is a uh, what we call a checkerboard reservation where there's um, neighborhoods of, that are reservation and then non, 
the, it's a small city or a small town. It's not a city. It's a small town. Um, and so he had a lot of white friends. And when the white friends and the Indians, the Lakota, would play cowboys and Indians, the Lakota always wanted to be the cowboys and the whites wanted to be the Indians. And so my grandmother showed me this photograph of my dad and all his little friends standing there dressed up as cowboys and all these little white boys on the ground <laughs> playing the dead Indians. He said, I, we never wanted to be the loser. And so we're raised being told that we're bad, that we're these losers, and we're being defined by other people. Other people are telling us who we are and telling us our history. And I knew that that history I was being fed was wrong. I knew that that wasn't true. It was so much more complicated. And when you get into mixed race identity and Dakota who had, you know, who came from the unions between Dakota and fur traders, it gets even more complicated. You know, and so this history is, is, in, is very um, complicated. And this history is very important to know. And this history was not being told at Berema Casca, formerly known as Lake Calhoun. And so a few years ago, um, my family, we, um, we started working on the process to, to really try and change that place and to assert who we are there. Um, so I'm here with you, my sister here today to talk with you a little bit about that process. Can you hear me? Hihani washte. Tokadaki amani wi mieye. Hey, the kotia. Washichu ya Carly Badheart bowl. Ema kia pie. Bade wa kanto wa hemacha. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Carly Badheart Bull, um, that's my, my English name. In Dakota, my name is Tokada Kiamaniwi, or a woman who walks toward the future. Um, so, um, and I'm happy to see you all today. Um, so, you know, it, when I think about our, my, my name and my, my sister's name, you know, my sister's name is Brings Them Home Woman, and my name is um, woman who walks toward the future. So we kind of balance each other out, which makes sense, um, I guess, as we're, we're, we're check pa. Um, so how we got involved with this name restoration process. You know, we, when we moved back here, um, my, it's so interesting to be in this room right now. Um, I remember, I don't know, I don't want to age us, but maybe 15 years ago? We're 40. <laughs> mm. We just turned 40. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, maybe 15 years ago or something, when, when we first moved back here, um, you know, as my sister mentioned, we didn't graduate from high school. We were really shy. Um, Dr. Child, who's in the audience, probably remembers it was a little hard to get us to talk back then. <laughs> now it's a little hard to shut us up sometimes. <laughs> um, but I remember being in this room and being asked to sit on a, a panel talking about Native women and how scared we were. Um, and so it's just, I just want to name that and say it's really an honor to be back here now all these years later. Um, um, it's, it, it feels really good. Um, and, and it's hard. It's hard to, that we're still having these conversations. Um, but we're going to continue still having these conversations because they need to be had. Um, so, at, you know, as my sister mentioned, we, we started, this, this, this name restoration process started a long time ago. Um, folks have been talking about the issue um, of the name Lake Calhoun um, for a long time. Um, many folks in the Native community in per particular, um, as well as in the African American communities. Um, and then in 2015, this is just where we jumped in along the way. Um, in 2015, um, I got a call from a Minneapolis Park Board, mem um, board Commissioner, um, Scott Breland, um, and they were putting together a, a community advisory committee, a CAC. Um, and the CAC, um, what those are is they're um, these groups of people um, that are appointed um, by Park Board Commissioners. They each get to appoint a certain number of folks um, to come together for a certain period of time to learn about an area um, and to do some research and then to provide recommendations. So this is how the Park Board does their community engagement and then provide recommendations for something. 
Um, in this case, um, the Park Board was putting together the Lake Calhoun, Lake Harriet Master Plan, um, which is to be a 25-year vision um, for, uh, for, the, for the parks um, and for the lakes. Um, so Scott Vreeland um, had, had gotten my name from, from somebody, and, um, and then uh, Brad Bourne, another um, park um, board commissioner, reached out to my sister Kate. Now we have different last names. I don't know if they knew that we were sisters, um, but we didn't tell them. Um, I don't know of any other Native people that have ever been, it's possible, but I haven't talked to any other, haven't heard of other Native people that have been asked to sit on one of these, and so I think we felt pretty good about having two voices at the table for once. Um, so we agreed to do it. Um, now when we, this was supposed to be, I think it was like a six to eight month process initially. Um, this process ended up taking us over two years. Um, and th there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but one of the things I wanna note is it was, it was hard. Um, this was a very democratic process in that um, you know, the, it was a 25-member community advisory committee um, which came together uh, over almost, almost two years and then there was all this waiting and then we'd come back for more hearings. Um, numerous public meetings, open houses, listening sessions, community events. My sister and I both have full-time jobs. We have families. Um, we had two kids along the way. Um, and so, one, I just want to note that um, I hope that with these, these, these democratic processes um, that they become much more in, um, inclusive um, and allow for people from our communities to participate, um, make them more accessible. Um, because it, it, we, we committed to doing this and it, 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 took, it took a toll. Um, but it, there was a reason for it and so we, we stuck with it. Um, but so over two years, um, we, we came together um, at numerous uh, meetings. Um, we were asked to, um, initially we were asked to, to utilize an equity lens in our recommendations. Now, the majority of the folks who were in the room were, were white. Uh, majority of them were residents from around the lakes, very affluent families. Um, they didn't know what that meant. Um, and, and so, none, none, and none of us did, you know, how do you just say, okay, now use an equity lens. Um, so we asked for, um, we wanted an equity subcommittee to come together to really dig in and to make recommenda equity focused recommendations. Um, and we got it. Um, so we had an equity su subcommittee that was created. We worked with a local nonprofit organization, Voices for Racial Justice. Um, and we set to work um, with doing uh, more intensive community engagement. Um, and what that meant was we went around to the different, different communities and we asked folks, what would you like to see at the lake? What would make you in your community more likely to, to come to the lake? Um, what would help you to feel welcome at the lake? Um, and we got a number of recommendations and all of those recommendations went into a report um, that eventually was given to the Minneapolis Park Board to help shape their master plan. Now, the number one recommendation, the number one equity-focused recommendation that ended up coming out um, was to change the name. Um, and not only to change the name, but to restore the name back to its Dakota name. Um, and that's something as my sister and I, um, you know, my sister's a historian, and, and as we started talking about the history, um, folks, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and a lot of folks just didn't know didn't know the history of who John C. Calhoun was, didn't know the history of Dakota people. Um, you know, there's a, there's a report that came out from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Um, it's a national report, but it's still pretty telling um, it, around, it's called Reclaiming Native Truth. Um, and I, I recommend folks take a look at it. Um, in this, rep this national report, um, 40% of the respondents said that they didn't know that Native people still existed. 40%. Now that's where we're starting from. So generally when my sister and I come to speak at an event, we have to start with Indian Country 101. We have to start with we're still here. Um, and then we can move into some of the more complicated issues, but that's a tough place to start. And that's where we had to start with this work. 
Um, so we started with that. We did Indian Country 101 for the Minneapolis Park Board members, for uh, at for you know community engagement meetings. You know, my sister talked about the history, and and then we dug in deeper. Um, and as folks took that journey with us and started learning more, they wanted to do something. Um, when we first started, when we first started having the conversation around the restoration of the name um, at these CAC meetings, people thought we were crazy. They thought, we don't have time for this. We're here to talk about fixing trails, fixing signs. We're not here to talk about a name. Names don't matter. Um, and the more we started talking, the more we started telling them our stories, the more we started telling them why it does matter, the more we started talking about our kids. You know, the, the, I, I work a lot um, in Native education um, in my work, and um, the number one thing that, that I hear from experts ar across Minnesota and across the region, um, the number one issue is that our kids don't know who they are, that they feel disconnected from their, their identities um, as Dakota people, as Anishinaabe people, and that's a problem. And we have some of the, despite the fact that we are these incredibly resilient people, I mean, when you hear, and you'll hear some more throughout the next couple of days about all of the very intentional policies and practices that have been put in place against us to exterminate us from existence, we're still here. We're incredibly strong, and we're smart, and our kids are strong, and our kids are smart. But when they're constantly being told, you don't matter, you don't exist, it takes its toll. And so there's reasons why Minnesota has some of the lowest high school, not just high school, but graduation rates for um, our Indian kids of, of in it, anywhere else in the country. Um, um, you know, we're, depending on the statistics, either at the bottom of the top of the, the barrel, um, across when we look at housing, um, economics, education. Um, and a lot of that is tied to our cultural identity um, and to our self-determination as Native people. And so as we started telling that story, um, folks were, they were on board. Um, and, you know, we had a park board, um, we actually had a couple park board members who, when we first started talking um, and, and saying we wanted to, that this was, this is what we wanted to, to focus on, um, they, there was some anger that came out at first. People thought we were really wasting their time. They genuinely thought we were wasting their time. Um, but fast forward two years later, those same park board staff members who were so frustrated with us, one of them actually retired and then ended up volunteering her time to help us. Um, so her worldview had shifted. Um, and that's the power of storytelling. That's the power of narrative change. Um, and so that's why we were doing this. I think we were going to try to share a couple, just a couple pictures. So, I, you know, as I mentioned, we had a number of other equity recommendations from things like, um, you know, access to restrooms, parking, because not everybody lives around the lake and can just walk home to use the, the bathroom. So we had a number of equity recommendations, but the number one was, was the name restoration. Um, a couple of the, I just want to share a few of the, the, the criticisms that came up. Oh, and here's some pictures. Um, it's a little blurry, but you can kind of see. This was actually, these pictures were taken um, on the day that, that the signs were officially changed. It was really cold that day. Um, but the majority of these pictures were taken um, on, uh, in January of this past year when, when, when the, the signs changed. I do want to acknowledge um, the gentleman um, on, the, um, on the, the right here um, wearing the headdress. That's Art Owen. Um, my sister and I are rather tired today. Um, we spent all day yesterday at his, his funeral. Um, but he did the blessing. Um, at, at uh, the, the, same, the sign change. Um, he's a, a leader um, from the Prairie Island Dakota community, um, and um, he's, he's a powerful man who's gonna be greatly missed. Um, but uh, I, I also wanna note that at his, at his funeral yesterday, um, I don't know how other people do funerals, I mostly go to native ones, but um, as we were, we were walking up during the final, final viewing, there was a table that had all these pictures. Um, and it was, you know, um, Uncle Art was a, a Vietnam vet. 
Um, he, he, he did a lot of amazing work in the community. He had a bunch of pictures of his family, his grandkids. Right there in the middle was the Star Tribune article about Bede Makaska. And that made me so proud that this was something he was proud of, um, that he was able to see in his lifetime that he was able to be a part of. Um, so uh, really quickly, the, I, I, I also want to note just a couple of things. Um, pe people often ask us, like, what were the criticisms, right? Um, and the, the biggest criticisms that we heard was that, one, we were trying to change history. Um, <laughs> it's true. This is the number, one of the number one um, things we heard was we're we were trying. We're revisionists. We're revisionists, apparently. <laughs> Um, we're trying to change history, um, and and because revising not, is bad, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's just not true. Um, and and as we started talking with people, what folks really started to to open up um, to is that we were actually giving a gift. Um, we're actually sharing our story, um, and that's a good thing. Um, it's expanding worldview. Um, and now, um, when we talk to, you know, we've made a lot of friends. We've built a lot of relationships with folks outside of the Native community um, who tell us that when they go to Bede Makaska, they see it differently. Um, and it's a good thing. Um, it's not a bad thing. Um, the other thing that we heard most often was that it's, it's too hard to say. Um, and I hear people say it wrong every day. I have family members that, that haven't quite gotten it, and that's okay. Um, it may take a little time. It took me forever to figure out how to say Xenium Lane, which actually <laughs> is connected to Bede Makaska, that X. Yeah. Why like, Zata? <laughs> it's actually Wazieta in Dakota. <laughs> but over time, <laughs> folks are gonna, you're gonna get it, right? Um, and, and so that's not an excuse. Um, in fact, our, my niece, um, who was three, well, three. She was two. I don't know how she was two when it started. Mm -hmm. um, she actually was one of the folks who helped us um, get the park board members to, to learn how to say Bede Makaska. Um, so she came up to would come up to the podium and have them repeat after her. <laughs> um, so actually, let's do that. Do you guys want to do it? Yeah. We're all working on it, right? Okay. So repeat after me. Bede, Bede. Maka, Maka. Ska. Ska. See. And actually, as a favor to, to our Anishinaabe relatives here, um, for Nokomis, Nokomis? It's actually Lake Nokomis. Nokomis? Can everyone say that? Nokomis. Pida, Maya. So, you know, and when we talk about indigenous language, our language defines who we are as, as indigenous people. Um, our language is descriptive. It paints a picture. Um, Bede Makaska stands for White Earth Lake. Um, and that's at one point, um, there were banks, sandy um, beaches around the lake. Um, and so that's where that name comes from. Um, our, 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 our words, our names um, help us, help connect us to who we are um, as Native people. And so that's one of the reasons, one of the key reasons why we wanted to do this. We moved back to Minnesota to connect to who we are to who we were as Dakota people, and we did it to come here to take the, to study Dakota at the University of Minnesota. Um, and yet that's also precisely why the United States government has worked so hard to take our languages from us. You know, you're gonna hear this afternoon about boarding schools. Um, our relatives were beaten for speaking their languages. That's why we don't speak or haven't spoken. My sister and I are, are, are working on, on taking that back. Um, I, I just, I'll add one more thing. Um, so the, the, the other thing that folks would tell us was that names don't matter. Um, and, and my response to that was, well, why are you holding on to it so hard? <laughs> they do matter. Who we honor matters. Whose story um, we're telling uh, matters. Um, it matters uh, to our kids. It matters to us as Dakota people, but it matters to all of us. Um, and so um, that was a huge part of, of, of why we did this work um, and why we continue to, to do the work um, that we're doing. And I think Kate had something else she wanted to add. Well, one thing I want to add is, is that I think that, you know, this work that we've done, sometimes it feels like tiny steps. You know, we, we, we work incredibly hard and we have to fight for every single tiny step that we make. And that can be really, really frustrating. We're also in a time politically right now where we're getting a lot of backlash. 
And so, and I know that from working at the Minnesota Historical Society and some of the work they're doing around Fort Snelling. I know that from the work I did at Bede Makaska. I foresaw what was coming um, for, for them in, in that case because of what I saw at Bede Makaska. You know, our father received hate mail at home. Um, we've received all kinds of criticisms. We've received some, some real um, scary responses, honestly. Um, I had to be very cautious when I started going to work and had to change the policy of how people can contact me because there was a stalker for a while. Um, it became really, really scary. Um, and why? Because we're telling a story, we're talking about ourselves. You know, and we're fearful for our children. And I think one of the things that was, was really hard for me when my daughter was three and she asked me if she could go up to the park board and teach them. She said, oh, they need help. You know, and she wants to help. And she, you know, I remember during one meeting when I stood up there and I was holding her and I was nine months pregnant with my second daughter and I was standing there with both babies and a woman who owned a home at the lake was sitting there and I gave my introduction at Dakota and just said who I was. And I said, my grandfather, Mark Piechowicz, died at the concentration camp below Fort Snelling. And this is who I am. And, you know, we had a home there too. It just looked different. And we would still have a home there if we could. We do. We should. And this woman just looked at me with such disgust and just shook her head. And I wanted to shield my daughter's eyes so bad. And I thought about, should I keep bringing her here? Because she kept having to, to see, see this. You know, it wasn't towards the end that people actually showed up. And it wasn't towards the end until the Save Lake, Lake Calhoun group showed, showed up. And one homeowner showed up and confronted us. And that was hard for me to let my child see that. But she wanted to be there, and she asked me, and she gets angry. She would be mad if she knew I, if she knew I was here today without her. <laughs> she sees it as her job. She went to school the day after we changed those signs. My daughter went to school, and she taught her entire class how to count to ten in Dakota, and she told them who Cal Moon was, that he was a bad man, <laughs> and that he drafted the Indian Removal Act. I mean, this was preschool. She was so proud, and she told them all how to say Bede Makaska, and I didn't find any of this out until parent-teacher conferences when the, the preschool teacher was like, yeah, she led the class in pronunciation. You know, and that makes me really proud, because when we look at the, the response that we got, the Save Lake Calhoun group, you know, they spent $30,000 in local newspaper ads and spread some really racist rhet rhetoric. Um, just an example, they wrote something that said, Dakota tribe and extremist activists demand the total erasure of iconic Lake Calhoun. Sadly, extremist We're trying political to drain the lake, apparently. <laughs> Sadly, extremist political activists have bullied our elected officials into agreeing to erase iconic Lake, lake Calhoun and replace it with Bede Makaska. Unbelievably, extremists refuse to compromise with dual name. They demand total erasure. Lake Calhoun is the first victim of what will be a tsunami of extremist name change advocacy. And there was a lot more of that that came out. And one of the biggest, one of the cr big criticisms too was that was, okay, why are we spending our tax dollars on this? It's gonna cost so much money to change the name of this lake. Number one, we didn't ask businesses to change their names. Some of them, like Perennial Cycle, which is awesome, everyone go buy your bikes there. They, you know, decided, small business owners, some of them decided to change the names of their businesses, others didn't. And we weren't asking them to. Um, but these people spent $30,000 on new newspaper ads, and then they raised $4,000 in a GoFundMe with a fake name of a guy named Adam Smith. Um, and yet, when I looked over the receipts of what we spent, we spent $30 on three Facebook booths for events to get people to come to, um, to the hearings. Those, those signs were gonna be updated anyway, that didn't cost any money. The park board has their own signage making facility where they make their own signs and they were gonna be making new ones because they were old. That didn't cost anything. You know, and so really is, is the financial component of it, is that really what it's about? No, it's not. You know, and as my sister said, names matter, words matter, and Dakota children matter. My child matters. And when my child goes to Bede Makaska now, 
My father and I also worked really hard with the city of Minneapolis and some Dakota artists, and we have some wonderful public art that's going up. And some of it's already there. You can see a railing along the side of the lake that says Hayato Otue, village to the side, on the southeast corner. Drive by there, and you'll see the public art in the ground. They're stamping that has a lot of Dakota artwork and language for our kids. And so when I take my kids there, they see the stamping and they see their language and they're so proud, they just love it. And that's why we do this work, so that our kids can go home and they can know that their legacy is important. The legacy of our grandparents is important. The legacy of our parents is important. Our legacies are important. And we're trying to create a space where the legacy of our kids is gonna be important too. Do we, do we have time for, we have a, a quick video. This was at, um, so, so just a little bit back to the process. So the, the name restoration, we went to the park board for first. They kept saying, we don't have the authority to change the name. We knew that. Um, but we also knew that as we um, went to other entities, um, that they were going to come, they were all going to come back to the park board to say, what do you think? Because they were the local governing body. So we started there. Um, and what we didn't expect to happen actually was that the park board um, were the ones who drafted the initial petition to the Hennepin County um, Board of Commissioners um, to, to change the name to restore the name. Um, we thought we would have to do that, um, and that didn't happen. The park board actually took that action um, for themselves um, and, and, and did it. And so this, this is actually um, the day um, that um, it was official, six o'clock in the morning. It was recorded in the state register. Um, and this was a January, very cold January morning. Um, and so we all went out and got to um, officially change the name, the signs. The name Akaska. See, it's not hard to Neil pronounce. McKay. It, it has vowels. I've read that. You know, so the name Akaska. Oh. morning, the name of the lake behind me was officially restored to Bidet Makaska. The restoration... <laughs> it's really important to understand that a big part of this decision was simply listening. Calhoun's systemic violence towards indigenous and peoples of color does not represent the values of the people of Minneapolis, and it does not represent the values of the Minneapolis Park Board. Our community has been advocating for this change for many, many years. This was something that was being advocated before, before we even moved back as people who are exiled from Minnesota. And we are proud to help elevate the voices of our community and to work with all of you to see this change happen, this restoration happen. We didn't grow up here in Minnesota. Our people were exiled from the state, um, and we grew up feeling very much homeless, um, and we struggled. And it wasn't until we came home and we started learning more about our language and our culture um, that we started feeling more connected to this place and finding out who we were. And so, you know, this is why we did this. You know, I want my son to know where he comes from. And not only that, but I want all of you to know that he comes from here. And I want all of you to know who our people are and the value and the contributions, not just to be acknowledged, but to be celebrated um, because we have a lot to offer this Pidame happy.